Welcome to the moment that changed everything, where we interview notable creative people to gain insights into how they got started and learn more about the moments that shaped them and their careers. Today, we sit down with Shane Ogilvy. Shane is the co-founder of the Toronto agency, The Garden Collective, working with such brands as Samsung, Roots, and the United Way. Ask yourself, is what you're doing gonna matter to somebody or make them mad? That's the other thing. Like in the world of internet advertising, I, and it's the part that clients have the hardest time getting their head around, but the cost of getting 50% on the internet of people liking you mm -hmm. is having 50% on the internet of people fucking hating you, if you're doing your job right. Shane has lived an interesting life to say the least, from working in the gold mines in his hometown of Timmins to selling Electrolux vacuums door to door. No, I'm not kidding to becoming one of the top 10 global leaders who is reinventing the advertising industry. Yeah, we had a lot to talk about. Let's just do this. I'm not gonna even say hello and welcome. Hi. <laughs> so our, our show just starts with me mid-sentence, which is great. Yeah, that's right. Uh, so let's we, talk about swearing, because apparently you swear a lot. I do swear a lot. And I learned, I came by it honestly, I grew up in, um, in Timmins, Ontario, mining community, and it, you know, blue, mining and lumber, hmm. um, and sort of really salt of the earth, good folks. And there's, there's, I mean, it's swearing there isn't so overt in the sense that nobody's swearing around grandma's table, but when grandma isn't looking, it's just like the, the vocabulary changes entirely. <laughs> and so I, I come by it fairly honestly, but one of the things I've noticed over the years, and one of the things that got pointed out to me when I first moved to Southern Ontario was the difference in how people swear in Northern Ontario versus Southern Ontario. So there's a heavy French Canadian app, um, uh, influence in Timmins. Okay. And so somehow it's intertwined the language a little bit, just not, not dissimilar to how in Quebec people throw English words into how they speak. And, sure. you know, it's, it's kind of like that. And, and what I noticed right away, I never noticed growing up, but in Northern Ontario, people punctuate their sentences with swears. So down here, they'll say, you know, you're a fucking asshole. Whereas up there they'll go, you're an asshole. Fuck. <laughs> <laughs> which, <laughs> which is, Bizarre. Yeah, that's it, a. But it never occurred to me. I, that's just how I heard swearing. You're growing. an asshole. Fuck. You're an asshole. Fuck. Wow. That fucking guy. Fuck. Like they'll they'll throw out the fuck at the end. And you and you're you know <clears throat> and rightly so you're thinking because I mean, as we all know, when you write a, a script in advertising and then you get it translated for the French version, oftentimes words are moved to different positions. Yeah. That sounds like exactly what was that's happening. That's what it is. It's, it's right? sentence structure. And yeah. you know, and when the and when French Canadians start to speak English, they they hold on to their sentence structure. Hmm. So they'll they'll communicate to you, but it kind of comes out a little backwards and it just became, you know, guys working together and, you know, picking up on those little ways and and, and things that people do with their speech. And it just that's how you swore. So growing up like you, you swore at the end of your sentence. So when you're growing up in Timmins, did that mean like your summer job was like in mining? It, well, later it was, yeah. Okay. Uh, so I had uh, a good run of jobs. I worked in construction and as a laborer. And you know, when you work in construction, when you're in high school, you tell everybody you work in construction in right. the summertime and they don't really know that you're just like pulling nails out of boards because they don't trust you doing anything <laughs> else. <clears throat> but um, no, I, I worked uh, with my with my dad um, in construction and then uh, moved into mining, I guess. I got my first job in the mine, I want to say when I was summer job, when I was 16 or 17. I think you had to be 16 as the, the edge mm -hmm. cutoff. And um, I worked at a mine called the Pamor. It was a gold mine. And uh, I started out on the surface uh, in, in what they call the mill. And that's where they, they crush they crush all the rocks. So they blow up, you know, these tunnels under, deep underground and they haul the, they call it the muck. They haul the muck up to the surface and, um, and it runs through a series of processes. It's actually quite fascinating. I mean, it comes out as these giant boulders, these mm. big out of the ground. And by the time it gets through the entire process of crushers and conveyor belts and everything else, it's a, it's a fine uh, silica powder. It's like, it's, it's, um, it's almost fluid. It's so, it's so fine. <laughs> and my job was to run one of the crushers, um, and uh, it was called a cone crusher. And and it sounds like a giant machine that could kill you, a hundred percent. And but it, you don't want to fall into the cone crusher. It's like the you know, it's almost like the equivalent of that monster in Star Wars in the yeah. desert, the, the, the deep sand. And I'm assuming that somebody had had fallen into the the crusher. Oh, uh, there'd been a. I don't know if. So here's the thing. I, I don't know if anybody ever fell into the crusher that I operated, mm. uh, certainly, but there was some nasty accidents that took place in that place. And, it, you know, 
partly because of the conditions were set up in a way that mm -hmm. it just wasn't super safe. Um, also partly because guys cut corners. I remember, can I tell you a disgusting story? Sure. I remember, uh, you may not want to use this. I remember, mm -hmm. um, the guy who worked the shift opposite I me, mean, we used to 12 hour shifts and a part of your shift at the end of the shift, you had to have your, well, you kind of had to do it throughout. So muck would fall off the belts, these giant conveyor belts, and it mm -hmm. would fall off onto the floor and you had to shovel it up onto the, onto the belt because every shovel full of, of muck was valuable. Could have some gold, fine yeah. gold mist in it. Well, or even bigger than that. Right. Yeah. So it was important mm -hmm. that that not get, and then, you know, obviously you can't have your floors all piled up anyway. So you would be, you would do your, we call banjo duty and you'd, you know, pick up your banjo and start shoveling. And, um, there was this one section along where the belts were, where there was a security uh, device on the gate. When you open the gate, it shut everything down. And right. the reason for that was the space was so narrow in between the, the belt and the wall that it wasn't safe to be walking there when it was running. Sure. But there was a bonus system that was based on tonnage and the more tonnage you push through your crusher, the more money you potentially could make. Mm -hmm. And so. Um, guys would tie off that safety feature to get in there and shovel with the belts running. So this poor guy um, climbs in to this space and start, and I did it myself. It was actually shocking to me. I think the part that shocked me the most was probably the fact that I exposed myself to that kind of danger and never really even thought about it. Mm -hmm. But he got in there and um, started shoveling and I guess decided he needed to take a leak. So he puts the shovel down and he's going to, he's going to piss under the belt. And there's this skirting wood skirting that keeps all the muck on the belts. And he puts his hand on the wood skirting and he starts to, to take his leak. Well, unbeknownst to him, his glove was kind of dangling there and the belt grabbed it and pulled his arm through a space this big, like about an inch. And I think, you know, the great relief he had was when his arm finally came off, like it just came right off. And he was left laying there and I don't know how long he was there or how anybody was notified by it, um, but eventually he was found. And the crazy part about it was, is that not only did he lose his job for tying off the safety feature, but he was fined by the ministry $25,000 wow. for breaking the rule. And he was blackballed from mines across country. He got lost a job. So he lost his Incredible. arm, he got fined. And, you know, it was those silly little things that you would not think about, right? And, and so many little close calls uh, that you hear about or that, you yeah. know, I was a part of even just some small little things where you're like, oof, you know, you'd be shoveling and the, the belt just grabs your glove and the glove's gone. Well, I know that, um, you know, there is a, there is a, a project that we didn't end up uh, doing any work on, but we went and talked to them. It was for, for Lafarge. And it was to develop a strategy to overcome what they called like being a cowboy right. on job sites, right? Because of course, you know, manly man, and it's like, uh, you know, let me just, you know, just put me in the bucket. That's right. You know, put me in the bucket and raise me up there and I'll tie the chains That's off, right. right? And it's like, and, uh, and the big thing that had to be combated, of course, was the fact that, um, you know, it was a macho kind of business. And, and if you were, if Shane goes, well, guys, I don't think we should tie off the safety feature and, or I got to tie myself in. It yeah. would be like, come on, man, we got, we don't got all day. Let's move yeah, it along. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So you're going to call your mom. Yeah, yeah. that's right. <laughs> and so, um, you know, I, I think about that and it's, it's interesting that you bring up Timmins and mining because the only other person that I know who is intimately aware about, of that kind of thing is Terry O'Reilly. Yeah. Who, who grew up in Sudbury. That's right. We have, uh, we have Northern roots. Right. Yeah. So the nickel mines and he, he told this story of, and we're way off advertising, but, but yeah. he told this story about in the morning getting onto the shaft elevator that would take them down deep below. Yeah. And he would be like a, bu a bunch of as many guys who could get onto this, into this elevator would get on and he'd be like pressed up against the back of the thing. Yeah. And as it started to dec decline and the oxygen in, in the, in the shaft became, get, started getting used up, all he could smell was booze. And this would be at like five in the morning. Oh yeah. No, they're definitely. So, um, you know, when I hear that, when I see this stuff in the news about, you know, coal mines in the South and all this, stuff, I just think about how rough it is. And, you know, uh, maybe a career in advertising is well it's funny right? it, yeah. it was i had an epiphany in sitting in the lunchroom yeah you know and that really it, you know living in timmins is uh 
you're far away from everything. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure Terry felt this as well. We, we've, we've chatted him and I about sort of growing up in the North and, sure. and shared some stories. And, and you really do feel disconnected. You feel far away from everything. Yeah. And even more like, you know, the notion of Hollywood or writing or like, that's not part. That's not going to happen to you. We don't you. do that. Right. Nobody does that. You, you get a good job and it's not in the arts. Hmm. And uh, there is a masculine macho culture that still exists, I think, to a certain extent. I'm, I'm sure it's, I haven't lived there in a long time. I'm sure, sure it's softened and I'm sure it's not quite what it was, you know, 30 years ago. But, sure. you know, I, I remember guys being too cool or too tough to let like the most, you know, the obvious things hurt them. It's like, the, I remember the, so the dusty, it was very dusty. So a lot of times the muck would come out of the ground and it wouldn't be wet, it would be dry. And when that happened, the whole mill would fill with this fine dust in the air. It was so thick, you couldn't see. Like you were literally, and so you had masks. They would provide masks for you. And these guys looked at you when you wore a mask, like you were, yeah. like you were Dr. weak. Dr. Jim, lungs of steel. Yeah, and they're right? smoking. And I remember yeah. like, you know, you'd be standing in a cloud of this dust wearing your mask, just baffled by these guys. And, and you know, all you could see was the ember of their cigarettes kind of as they're, as they're inhaling. Oh God. And you're like, how is this? And how would you feel you're invincible to this? I don't care how tough you are. This is just stupid. Well, these guys would be what? in their 20s they'd be they'd be young men right or would they no be, these are really? the older guys wow. right? it was the older guys who would sit oh, there really? and just they've been doing it for so long and they, mm. they when they started there were no masks and there were no safety measures and look i'm still around why are you worried about right this? you know mm. and interesting um and then i remember having that epiphany i remember sitting in a lunchroom with a bunch of these guys and a ton of respect for them by the way like this isn't me diminishing mm -hmm. the role it's a, it's a hard job and Absolutely. these guys dedicate their lives to doing it and they raise their families on the money they make there and it's it's a tough life. Mm -hmm. And, um, but I remember sitting around and going, there's gotta be more than this. There's gotta be more than what these guys are. You know, I've heard that joke now 47 times this week. How is right. it, you know, we've got to right. get somewhere else with it. And it's, and it, it's just, I feel like I can't do this. I can't keep up with what they're up to and what they're doing. And so it was the first spark I had that was like, kind of like, I need, I think I need to figure out how to get out of here and, and do something else. Well, yeah. So talk a little bit about that. Uh, you know, how did you wind up from the lunchroom and the, the mining thing to, to getting involved in advertising? How'd that work? Oh, that that's, we don't have, an, that's a long journey. That's a too long. That's story. a long You can journey. skip maybe, I'll you know, skip I don't a know. couple of things. <laughs> um, yeah, I, you know what, truthfully, I had a bit of a, I had a bit of a misspent youth. And so, and when I got into my later teens, I started to, when I got into my earlier teens, I got into some trouble, but it mm -hmm. started to progress. And I, I got into more and more, it's made bad decisions. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, I think, you know, a lot of people in my life, if you ask them at that time, were, were kind of writing me off. I think they thought, oh, well, it's too bad. He's, mm -hmm. he's not going anywhere and he'll probably end up in some trouble somewhere along the way. And, and I deserved that. I was kind of, you know, um, like I said, making bad choices and kind of unfocused and not, I guess, just directionless a little bit. And I think a lot of that came from some of the angst I felt living in that town and mm -hmm. want, as a person who needs to be stimulated, who needs to be challenged, who needs to be, I just feel like maybe it wasn't happening. And, and that's, you know, in retrospect, I think back and that's maybe what was going on. But um, so I spent a lot of time kind of traveling around and concerts and, you know, bumming around the United States and bumming around Canada and got into selling drugs and I got into some pretty heavy scenes and, and, um, y you know, it was my grandfather actually eventually who kind of called me up and was like, what are you, like, what are you doing? What's, mm. what's the plan? Like, what's your goal here? And, and, um, I didn't have one. I didn't really have a clear answer for him. And I, and I kind of had, um, you know, I wasn't, I wasn't in a good space. So he convinced me and my uncle Garfield Ogilvy uh, convinced me to, um, come back to Ontario. I was, I was at West somewhere and, and, uh, and, you know, try to find a job. And, and so I went to Ottawa and I got a job weirdly, um, because I couldn't get anything else. I had no education. I had no, you know, skills. Yeah. What did your resume say? Like, look like at that point? <sighs> Hamor Mine, like crusher operator, uh, yeah. McDonald's hmm. when I was fourteen. Uh, you know, there wasn't a whole lot of depth to the resume and the skill set, and there wasn't a lot of opportunity. And and I was a little desperate. I was crashing on a friend's couch and really didn't have a lot of uh, options. Hmm. And I weirdly, and this is funny because this actually had, in hindsight, a tremendous amount of impact on me. And at the time, I, I didn't know, but I, I ended up taking, I got, a, there was an ad in the paper that said, you know, sales job, 
come in and we'll, we'll, we'll make big money, right? And, and I get there and it's Electrolux vacuum cleaners and uh, it's a door knocking job. It's like selling vacuums door to door. <clears throat> and it was 100% commission, there was no salary, and they just got dupes like me to come off the street. And it was a numbers game, right? The more doors you knock on, the more chances you have of selling a, a vacuum cleaner. And the commission was a bit of a, a triangle scheme. And the draw for you was the money, or did you, did you look at that and think, no, I'm pretty good with uh, you know, making conversation with complete strangers. No, I had mm. no, I had no self awareness about that about mm. myself. I think that wow. was probably it may have been obvious to other people, but to me, I, I had so such. I think at that point, such less so, like low self confidence, mm. and so so. And it's so strange because you need you need supreme confidence to knock on a stranger's no, tell door. Me about it. You have and, no idea. I mean, that is like. Uh, I mean. I, I just think about cold calls themselves and it just makes me just want to, you know, die inside. Yeah. yeah. It, well, it was horrifying for mm -hmm. me and I wasn't very self-aware and I didn't know my qualities. I, I knew a lot of my faults and mm -hmm. I could rhyme those off pretty quickly. Um, but I was desperate. I needed, I needed a job and they made it sound easy. Mm -hmm. They made it sound like it kind of took care of itself. Come mm -hmm. on, get out here guys. You know, we'll show you. And I'll, I'll never forget. There was a guy, so I went out there and I, at first I really sucked at it and it was, it was all, and this is what I pulled from it. I actually apply this in my, my career today. And I think a lot about it, it, it has impacted my writing and it's impacted how I approach things. But mm. at the time it was like, you know, you knock on a door and it's like, hi, I'm from Electrolux slam. You knock on the next door and it's like, hi, I'm from Electrolux slam. And I'm like, fuck, how do these guys get? How, how many of those are you going to take before you well, basically go, this is wasted? Well, I right. But it. I mean, how am I ever going to get in the door? Mm -hmm. Like, I don't even know. So, you know, it's like, it's like, it's like I don't know, let's say something like 150 doors to get one presentation. Right. And 10 presentations to get one sale. Like, I'm never going to do this. Right. And there was this guy, Ray, and he was a French Canadian guy and like big personality, big, you know, kind of swinging dick kind of dude, you know, and big mm -hmm. mustache and character, vacuum cleaner salesman. <laughs> right. And I remember watching him and just being astounded. And at first it didn't click, but I remember it sort of when it started to piece together for me, I started borrowing his techniques, but he never walked up to anybody and said, hi, I'm Ray with Electrolux. He walked up to people and he, he was a master almost of finding what mattered to them. Hmm. And he opened with that. And I remember the moment, like it was a very specific home that we walked up to because the woman was outside and she was gardening and she had marigolds. She was playing around with the marigolds. And he brought up this idea that his wife had heard that it was good to plant marigolds with tomatoes because it kept insects away or something. I don't mm. remember, but he, he, that's what he opened with. And she was like, your wife's right. And she starts talking about gardening and marigolds. And he's chatting with her about all the things that matter to her. It was clearly a passion for her. And eventually the conversation got to, what are you doing on my lawn? And he said, oh, you know, I'm just out knocking on doors because we've got this really cool product that we're sharing with people. And, and she was open, she was there, she was yeah. warmed up, come on in. And he sold her a vacuum cleaner. And I remember just being like gobsmacked. Mm -hmm. And it, it was the first time I realized that, you know, there isn't a standard approach to anything. You have to actually think really hard about your way in. And, and that sort of opened my eyes. So I, after that, I started to really apply those those things and I started opening conversations differently and it started to work and I started selling vacuum cleaners. Wow. And I ended up getting really good at it. <laughs> like really good. Like wow. I, I think at one point I was the second ranked sales guy in Canada, which is bonkers when I think back on that. Cause I was just a young, I was in my early twenties and I was just a punk who had no confidence and knew what he was doing. Um, and it kind of rolled from there. And, and so <clears throat> I, 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 there was only so much I could do that and that, that'll burn you out pretty quick. And it, mm -hmm. you know, it was fun for a bit cause I made a few bucks, but it wasn't going to be my life. And it was my uncle Garfield who actually called me in and, and, um, he worked at a media company, an outdoor company. And it was one of those, like the family's worried about me. What am I doing? And, um, he sat me down and, and asked me, you know, have you ever thought about getting into this business? You know, media sales, I'm like, no, but I mean, you seem to be doing okay. You drove a BMW, mm -hmm. nice suit. I'm like, maybe I can do that. And he started telling me more about the job and I realized that just wasn't going to be me. Hmm. But weirdly, it was a weird coincidence because that day there was a copy or no, sorry, an art director in the building um, checking out uh, proofs and uh, there was an introduction made and I started chatting with him and he started telling me a little bit about what he did and about what ad agency was and what that world looked like. And hmm. that was really interesting to me. 
Um, so it just kind of put a bit of a bug in my ear about this industry that I never even knew was a thing, really. I mean, I knew ads existed and I was aware of it. And obviously I, I liked ads. I thought the funny ones were good. And the, right. we all remember Michael Jackson's hair going up in flames. Like that we, I, I was, you know, mm -hmm. it's part of the popular culture, but it wasn't something I ever considered as a thing that you could do. It's so interesting that you bring that up. I mean, first of all, great. I mean, that's a, this is a great story so far. I mean, I want to find out more about how it all came about. But, you know, one of the things that when Chris Hirsch was on, we talked about this specifically. We talked about the set, the, the salesmanship required. Mm -hmm. I, I did. I mentioned that I thought the most creative people would be the most successful. And that's definitely not the case. Right. Um, and here you are, who has won everywhere. I mean, uh, and, you know, I think... I think people who who would look at at you and see the amount of success that you've had, um, they want to know like how you do it, right? And right. and but I think in this story, what you're revealing is like that had to be something that you leaned on heavily in order to sell work. Well, it's not just selling work. So selling work is huge. Mm -hmm. Knowing your audience and um, going into the room and understanding that your pitch doesn't work for everybody. So you have to adapt. And you have to understand that there's an audience who's waiting for information from you and they're going to absorb that information differently than the last audience you were in front of. And too often I see teams go in with a shtick. They have a thing that they like to do and you hear them talk about it. It's like, oh, they're so good in the room right? because they have this, this duo and like, I read the script and they act it out or. Sure. And it's like, that's not, that's not how you do it. Like what you have to do first and foremost is understand what is the person who you're selling to looking for? Mm. What's worrying them? What's, what are they hoping to get out of this meeting? What's, you know, what do they need to know in order to feel good about moving forward with the thing that you're putting in front of them? And understanding that insight um, helps you shape your presentation in a way to make sure you're solving that problem for them. The other piece is where it really worked was in my writing. Understanding the audience, and that's not new news, right? Mm -hmm. Like dig up Ogilvy on advertising, look at what Bernbach used to say. I mean, all those guys, they intuitively knew, you understand your customer. Right. And I feel like we've lost that a little bit because our customers seem so fractured and so. Well, and I mean, it, it's a, it's a good point. I think, I think, uh, I mean, I would think that part of the reason why that exists is the brief writing process, because I mean, we've all come across a brief and the way in which they describe the target audience is, is, majorly demographic mm -hmm. you know it's it's rarely psychographic mm -hmm. and um when you boil down a customer to an age group and a sex yeah well then what is a creative person to do right, right? all they do is they go you you a woman <clears throat> right. you, you buy this right <laughs> and and it's like there's nothing there's now now i have worked with some very good planners and stuff like that that mm -hmm. dig deep into the psychographic kind of thing but like that that must be what you're talking about but, but that's got to be one of the reasons why it's got to be the, one of the reasons why we see so much advertising that is that seems to be void of insight yeah i mean i think the void of insight part is good i think you know i see a lot of so i mean to touch on the thing you're talking about i think yeah it doesn't help when you get a brief that says we're trying to reach everybody which is mm -hmm. essentially what people do now like right. the, it's like we so what we, you know, we try to do the garden, what we talk a lot about is like it's mindsets and, and it's understanding people from a mindset standpoint, not necessarily a demographic standpoint, because mm -hmm. you can be a millennial and then that, you know, fuck the millennials. I think right. I'm so, and not that not right. nothing personal millennials, I think you're all, <laughs> you're all lovely, but I, it's more like, I'm just yeah. so tired of hearing like, well, we need to reach the, the millennial right. and, and now right. it's Gen Z. Yeah. And it's like, no, what you're looking to do and Sherry, my, my business partner, Sherry Walzak always talks about it. It's like, it's a millennial mindset. Right. Because the boomer who's got the iPhone 11, mm -hmm. who's crushing, you know, I don't know, who's got their Spotify lists and who are on, like, who are actually living and actively out there engaging yeah. with technology and, and living a life that isn't grandpa waddling mm -hmm. down the sidewalk. And that's a mindset. Yeah. So it's understanding people's mindsets and understanding where they are. And, and in today's world, it's about really noting, like noticing what's going on out there and, and really understanding what people are feeling. And so coming on, you know, going back to the vacuum cleaner days, like when I, when I think about how you approach a customer today, it's like, what matters to you? Mm. Particularly in the context of this credit card or this clothing line or, what, or whatever it is that we're talking about. And how do we make it matter to you? And that's, that part is the creative process that doesn't, it's not just a creative person's job. Like that is, you know, when like Sherry and I founded the garden, it was a strategist and a, and a creative. 
we actually at first uh, decided we weren't going to have account people, which was a terrible idea. <laughs> and I, it was so funny because I think in the first four months, uh, I realized what such a like so the, the value that a great account person brings that I almost I almost took out an open letter apologizing to every account person I'd ever been mean to uh, in my career because I just missed them so much. Well, listen, we'll get into, you know, advice for younger creatives, but I think that would definitely be one of the, the pieces of advice I would give to a young creative is that you I don't know if it's still the same way because I've been out of agencies for long enough now, mm -hmm. but um, certainly when I worked at big agencies, there's a culture of uh, there's a culture of this and them when it comes to uh, you know us and them when it comes to creative and, and accounts yep. right um, you know and account people are are are, are human too right like <laughs> you know creative people are trying to sell their work and they have this sense that the account person has jumped over to the other side of the table and that they're gonna you know they're gonna protect the client or they're gonna right. represent their thoughts and yeah. feelings and stuff like that and it's easy to make them the enemy and yet at the same time probably one of the best things that you can do is to really get close to the account people because because um, they can be instrumental in making the process so much smoother. Yeah, you know? I don't. Well, I don't disagree with that, but I actually want to push that a step further. Mm -hmm. And I actually think one of the fundamental challenges our industry has faced and the way that nobody talks about it is why have we ever why did we create this us and them notion to begin with? Mm -hmm. And when I don't when I say us and them, I don't mean us and the account people. We should always be on the same team. We're not, I get that in, mm -hmm. in the structure. And trust me, I spent enough years right. frustrated and, and feeling left out to dry when the account person take, makes a left turn in the room. And, and usually they probably had a good reason to, to be honest, it's sure. just, you know, I was just so focused on winning my award or whatever mm -hmm. it was that I wanted to do. But the, the us and them part is the problem because it shouldn't be about us and them. It, and it, the client shouldn't be them. Right. The client should be us. We should all be there. And so, you know, this idea of being protectionist of our work or not showing the client too soon or they're going to screw it up or they don't get it, like that's so fundamentally wrong. And I think at the end of the day has created a lot of what you're describing, like a lot of those problems where like, you know, the work doesn't get sold. And when you think about it just logically, it makes sense. I'm going to come to you and I'm going to give one person over here a brief right. and that person's going to distill that brief down into a document and that document is going to get shared with three other people. And those three other people are all going to make their own little tweaks and changes. And then they're going to have their own interpretations of it. And then eventually it gets down to the creative people. And it's like, okay, guys, you've got two weeks. Make this happen. Mm -hmm. And the client hasn't seen or spoken to anybody in six weeks. Right. And then we walk into a room with the dog and pony show with here's your three options. We've got one we really, really believe in. And we're going to shove this down your throat whether you like it or not. Because we have ulterior motives, by the way. We have an idea in our head about what we can win with this or do with this. And it really has nothing to do with your business. Right. And we're going to sell this to you. And the client is in this situation where they're like, this doesn't at all resonate with what I was thinking six weeks ago. Sure. Or what I'm thinking today. Right. Because the things have changed in six weeks. And my world has kept moving absent of you guys. Right. And none of this is right. And then the clients, so the clients push back or they feel pressured or they feel like this isn't, you know, and then the, and the creators go, well, you don't get it. Or the account person fucked this up. They didn't sell it hard enough. It's like, no, shit changed. Right. Because shit changes. It's a fast moving world. So the idea is for me is like, let's eliminate that us and them. Let's bring them in. You know, clients are the experts in what they do. We have to understand that. We can disagree or we can talk about whether they get it or don't get it. And director's treatments, fine. They probably don't get it. But they get their business. And they get, they get it on a level that we'll never get it. We're not experts in what they do. Right. We're, we are generalists. We are generalists in everything that we do. Well, what do you think about the way that the industry is set up? I mean, we still know that that um, uh, creative, highly awarded creative is something that's valued. Mm -hmm. um, maybe you know, I mean, we could probably draw the same the same kind of analogy from the, the mill where, uh, uh, you know, the more productive the line, the more money they're going to make. Yeah. So they've created an environment where skirting safety uh, issues is something that, you know, you know human beings are going to do because they want to, you know, they're motivated to do it. Yeah. And we work in an industry where, you know, winning an award, I mean, you know, God forbid you're a team out there that hasn't won anything for several years. And yet, so I guess my question is, is like, 
are they mutually exclusive? Um, what do you think about that? Because we, we live in this world where it's like, you know, you'll hear everybody say it. You know, it's like clients don't, clients don't care about the awards. They want to see uh, an uptick in business, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, and probably the most creative ad that was ever created was like half off refrigerators. Yeah. Right. And so what about this, this kind of like, is it, 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 is it a war between those two things or can they be the same? I mean, I have an opinion. Yeah. And it, I, I don't know if you're aware we don't enter award shows at the garden. Right. And we, that was a founding decision. Yeah. I saw that. I went to, I went to the website and I said, that's interesting for yeah. a guy that's won almost every single one. Yeah. And, um, here's the thing. I believe in the power of creativity. I actually believe it's one of the most powerful forces, not just in business, but in the world. I think at, the, at the, its core creativity is what affects change it, it creates change it, it's the it's what pushes people forward as 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 a species as societies it's always creative mm -hmm. i think that as a side note i think that our industry puts far too narrow a focus on that definition of what creativity is creativity in our business is art directors and copywriters and designers mm -hmm. and nobody else is creative and you'll have some agencies out there talking about well you know count people can be creative too it's like no no you don't understand creativity is problem solving and today our clients' problems are sometimes much, much bigger, usually much bigger than I need to sell X number of widgets. Mm -hmm. So how do we do that? So when you talk to me about sort of my, the value that I place on creativity, it's incredibly high. I believe in it. It's, I've lived my entire career through it. And I believe that award-winning work works. So don't get me wrong. I, I, mm -hmm. I see the value in it and I see the impact. But truthfully, the problem is when the breakdown is that we're trying to solve two different problems. And I see it too often in our, in our creative departments is the creative team who hasn't won that award yet needs to win an award. So they're so focused on winning that award that they're not thinking about what they're really doing here for the client and what they need to do. Sure. And it, they're not, it's not mutually exclusive. Like it's not like you can't, like when the client has a problem, creativity can solve it. But we have to be focused on solving the problem in order to do that. And I think too often the, the, the focus for the client is I need to solve my problem. The focus for the creative team sometimes is how do we win an award? How do we win? This? That's right. And so there's a division there. And when I talk about us and them, I, you know, and certainly in the culture that we're building at the garden, it's about bringing the client in and making them a part of what we're doing. So they're not drawing, mm -hmm. they're not coming up with the ads, they're not coming up with the ideas but they're there helping us solve the same problem. And they're helping us make sure that the problem as things shift and as their business rolls forward um, and things are moving and it's, it's a busy dynamic world. And like, we're not living in the old slow pace world that we, we remember when, when I certainly, when I started the business, sure they're on that journey and I, you have to make sure that there's no light between us and we have to be working towards solving that same goal. So the expectation from me as a creative director is that you're going to do the kind of work, that would win awards because you've done it well, right. but it also it's being done because there's actually a real problem that we're trying to solve. And I don't at this stage ever want to find that I have a division between me and the client and the problem that we're all trying to solve together right. by muddying the water with a different carrot. Yeah. I mean, I, I, uh, I think the most, one of the more frightening things for a creative person, and, and I'm sure you're going to have an opinion about this, is um, what's, what's seemingly the absence of a problem. Mm -hmm. It's much easier to see a glaring problem and then start to create work that at least attempts to, to overcome that obstacle. Right. Because you got something to press against. But, um, you know, sometimes, you know, what's your, what's your experience in terms of, you know, what about someone launching a business? I mean, I know that awareness can be a problem, Yeah. but, um, but you know, I think for creative people, if there's too many ways to go, it can be almost paralyzing. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So what do you do in those instances? Cause you must meet entrepreneurs and people launching businesses. Sure. I mean, well, when you talk about, yeah, I mean, first thing we try to do when we meet a, you're talking specifically about startups, mm -hmm. a ton of them out there, obviously. And Everybody's got a great idea. It's one of my favorite things to work on, actually, is because it's one of those few places where you get to work with the founders. You get to work with the passion, right? right. Because there's a tremendous amount of passion there. And, and no offense to marketers, because a marketer can certainly bring a tremendous amount of passion to their job and to their role and desire to do great things. And I believe that. But you'll never match the passion of somebody who's got everything in it. 
Like this is their, they've done this. Yeah, double, you know, doubled up on the mortgage. All yeah. all the chips go pressed right into the middle and also 24 seven. Right? Yeah. And so the first thing we try to do is understand and help them understand why they're doing what they're doing. Mm. Cause once you get there, the other pieces start to fall, fall into place. And the answer can't be, I wanna make money. Right. Because if it's if it's because I want to make money, we don't want to work right. with you. I mean, I want to make money too. That's a that's a hopeful result. That's right. right. That's an outcome. Right. That's not that's not what you're doing. So what are you doing, and why are you doing it? And this is again, this is Sherry and and her way of looking and part of the process that we developed is this idea of of you know we hear about purpose, and I'm not talking about purpose based advertising. I'm not talking about getting, you know, Gillette. To, to, to discuss gender. This mm -hmm. is, that's not what I mean. Mm -hmm. It's about like, what is your purpose? What's your, why do you get up out of bed every morning? What's your North star? What's the thing that drives you so that you can fundamentally understand that, create that foundation and have a clear line of sight on what the mission is. So not only for yourself and for us so that we're all aligned and we know how to solve for it now creatively, we, we can start to pinpoint the obstacles. We can start pinpointing <clears throat> those problems that you might encounter in delivering on that. But it also has this magical effect of bringing everybody who's on board to this great place of understanding. So, mm -hmm. your new, your you know, your small team who comes in every day and it's chaos because startups are chaos, and the hours burn by and people are sweating and nobody really knows. It feels like a lot of churn, and you know, you're giving people that sense of purpose. They understand what the mission is. So that's that's a big thing for us when we deal with the startups. It's first and foremost, like why? What's your why? Mm -hmm. What are you doing here? And that applies to all brands, truthfully. I, I feel like you know, a lot of the bigger brands have gotten into that space where they understand what their, their core purpose is. But that's, that's always the jumping off point. And then, the, and then from there, like what problem are we actually trying to solve? You know, we were talking earlier about you know, sitting in a boardroom. I've, it's hundreds of times I've sat in a boardroom where the client's like, well, we need this TV commercial to work. Right. It's like, well, why? What? Like, what, what's the problem? Well, this is happening and we need to be. And it's like, well, the commercial is not going to solve that. The commercial might actually amplify that problem. Mm -hmm. the, the commercial may actually, it was Bernbach who said, you know, nothing kills a bad product faster than great advertising. So it's like you, what we want to do is we want to understand, first of all, what is the problem, the real problem that we're looking to solve? And so by starting with not what do you need from us, mm -hmm. but why do you need it? And that becomes the jumping off point. And that often has us swimming further upstream than the point of, of execution. Do you ever, have you ever found yourself in a situation where like, I'm listening to you talk and, you know, of course, being in many boardroom tables and, you know, sitting down across from clients, some clients being in, in, insanely uninterested in, in, um, developing, um, really thoughtful, creative. Yep. You know, like, you know, I don't know if this has ever happened to you, but sometimes it'll, the sense that you'll get is like, why are you asking me so many questions? Mm -hmm. Here comes Shane. He's going to ask me all these hard questions. And, <laughs> you know, some of them might seem abstract. And what am I going to yeah. do? And then if you have that, some, do you ever, have you ever found yourself, uh, especially now with your own place that you find is like, this isn't going to be a fit? Or do you just see that as a challenge? Yeah. You know what? Well, so first of all, the people asking the hardball questions are Sherry. Like, mm -hmm. I, I'm, yeah, you know, let's face it, I'm me. <laughs> but um, no, for sure. And I, I think, you know, it's, um, it becomes painfully obvious. We're really upfront with, with new business when mm -hmm. we talk about our process and, and the, the need for their involvement. And when we say collaboration and we talk, everybody says collaboration, it's the first slide on every fucking presentation in the sure. business. But we actually mean it. And, you know, it gets back to this notion of them being their experts. They're experts and we can't do it without them. So we lay that out in a pretty honest way. And we're, we're, we're not afraid to have them be nervous about that or, or feel uncomfortable about it because mm -hmm. I want them to consider that. Because if it's not something that they're going to want to do, and if it's not the kind of journey they want to go on, then we're probably not going to be a good fit. Right. So we're never in a situation where we're like, well, we don't want to fucking work with you. Like, I'm not that privileged. Like, I don't have right. that, that, you know, I wish. Right. But we're certainly not afraid to be completely transparent and honest about the way that we plan to tackle the process and the expectations that we have on our clients in order for them to find the success that they have. And so typically the, the client you're describing 
will not choose us right based mm. on you know the fact that that's going to be a thing sure so yeah interesting um maybe maybe i'll ask you this because you know i know some of the the listeners will be young creatives wanting to break into the business yeah we're talking at a fairly high level now right yeah. you I'm know a phone call excuse me yeah no worries take it the... <laughs> hello <laughs> Um, we're talking about a very high level. This is like, you know, this is, this is, this is, uh, this is an education that's been, you know, that's been, um, cultivated for decades. Yeah. Right. What would be your advice for a, a young creative person who is either looking to get in the business or has just started in the business as it relates to finding that connection to, um, the truth, finding that connection to the what, the why that you talk about, right? What's, what's, what would be the first step in trying to, trying to dig that out of a client or a scenario where they got to create work? Fuck. I know that's a tough question. That is a tough question. You know what? I like my first bit of advice to a young creative trying to get into advertising is go to Facebook. No, I'm just <laughs> <laughs> get the fuck out of here. <laughs> that's right. Don't. Mm -hmm. We we did a we did a we did a series with a uh, for Yamaha that was like prof with professional musicians and that's exactly yeah. what one of the musicians is like, you know, you can be really passionate about playing an instrument and you could play it at home and you can get a lot of joy out of it. Yeah. And then the next level is being a professional and my advice for most people would be don't do it don't do it yeah, yeah. i'm teasing i think yeah. you know, there's i think our industry is going through some uh, a lot of self-doubt and a lot of self-hatred right now and i think mm -hmm. a lot of us are feeling maybe not as good about what we do as we used to and i don't know why that is because i feel like truthfully and I'm, i'll get to your question but sure. I, I feel like truthfully i i feel like i feel blessed in the sense and, and not the jesus kind of blessed but i just feel lucky you mm -hmm. know in the sense that i get to like get up every day and pick up a bat and have a chance to swing as hard as I can to, you know, to, to put something out there and, and to, to create something fun or create something meaningful and, and to be famous, even if it's for a couple of days, mm -hmm. you know, and what other job really provides that to you? And I, you know, I think back to that lunchroom and I, I look at those guys and, you know, that, you know, again, nothing wrong with what they're doing and they, they dedicated their lives to some hard work and, and, and they've, provided for their families. But I mean, geez, I, you know, I get up every day and I get to do something pretty cool. So right. I love it. Mm -hmm. And, um, so I, the first thing I'd probably say to a young person coming to me, looking to get into this business and, and trying to figure that out is to just embrace it and understand that there's a lot of fun to be had and there's still some really cool stuff you can do out there. And, mm -hmm. and, you know, then to really love that. And then when it comes to understanding the why and getting into that, I mean, thankfully, I think a lot of, we rely on strategists a ton and I know so many creatives don't. And I know mm. so many creatives look at the strategist as being this layer of unnecessary creativity. And some of them are like, there's a lot of really bad sure. strategists out there and they're putting, you know, they, they approach it the wrong way, I think sometimes. And, and it, it can drive creatives nuts because it really kind of puts you in a box where you can't fight out of it. And so I think having a good strategist and a good, a good, good healthy outlook on that goes a long way and, and embracing those strategists and understanding that if they're good, they can come to the table with some insights that will really just help you jump from that that smart insightful spot but the part for me is like ask yourself you know what is what you're doing going to matter to somebody and typically we get excited i find often creators especially young creators will get really excited about a, a technique or they'll mm -hmm. get really excited mm -hmm. about a uh, a digital medium somehow that's now you know it's fresh and it's new and they want to do something for it or there's you know there's some other kind of device that allows them to do something cool sure and it's like, those are all vehicles. Those are how your idea might get out there. But think first and foremost, who's gonna care about this besides you? Right. Like start there and, and start with what, what's gonna matter to people. And you know, when you talk about, is it gonna make people feel something? Is it going to stop somebody and make them think, even if for a second? Right. Or make them laugh or make them mad that's the other thing like in the world of internet advertising i and it's the part that clients have the hardest time getting their head around but mm -hmm. the cost of getting 50 percent on the internet of people liking you mm -hmm. is having 50 percent on the internet of people fucking hating you right, right. if you're doing your job right right <clears throat> because you're making people feel something and nobody nobody agrees about anything anymore so 
if you're doing, you know, so when you're thinking about it through that lens and you're thinking, okay, I, I'm sitting here and I want to connect with the why of somebody, it's like first and foremost, think about it from a human perspective. Like, mm -hmm. is what you're saying going to matter? And is it going to connect with somebody in a meaningful, emotional way? And if it is, then you're probably off to the right start. And then let the idea drive how it comes to life. I mean, I felt for a long time and maybe, you know, may, maybe, I don't know if you feel the same way. The technology is always going to be this double-edged sword. Yeah. Um, young creators now can create things that look fully realized. Uh, it looks like a real thing. And when I started, yes, there was technology there, but uh, it, it seemed as though you would still see like portfolios that had just a white backdrop and a headline, which which sometimes is the is is a great place to be because if you can get if you can create say an outdoor board with using like you know six words or less then you really should know what the hell you're saying yeah. right and you don't have a lot of this uh, these other things that are going to be look cool and um, and I don't even know what to think about when I see advertising that's that's highly awarded that is almost a hundred percent execution. Mm. Like it just looks, looks great, really cool. It's, or that's an illustration that I haven't seen before. Yeah. Um, it's always better when it's tied to some kind of, you know, insightful nugget. Um, of course, yep. but there's plenty of stuff out there that is almost all flash. Yeah. And I think it's also coupled with this, this, you know, we can maybe I'll ask you this question. You know, one of the, one of the canned questions that I like to ask people is like, and I never get to it, by the way, I have all these questions, never get to them. Um, you know, what's the scourge in the industry? You know, what's the thing that you see that kind of drives you a bit okay? And I always put at the end of the question, it's okay to rant, but um, I feel like, you know, the economics of how the business works um, with this real hard downward pressure and especially agencies trying to make it work, well, they've, they've eliminated the middle and, and in eliminating the middle of creative departments, you're kind of eliminating the mentorship that happens. Yeah, no, for sure. So now, you know, and I'm sure we're going to live this where we, we might see the ascension of, of young creatives who maybe haven't, haven't had the schooling or education that maybe you or I had enjoyed by really strong strategic creative people, bringing them up, nurturing them, giving them jobs that weren't like the, the big, big, the big jobs so that by the time you got to a, the, to a senior level, you, you had a pretty strong grasp of, of strategy and yep. that kind of thing. Yeah. So, so what do you think the, uh, right now? What's, what do you think the scourge is and, and, or what are, what are your insights as it relates to where the industry is and, and how it's going to fix itself? Cause it doesn't, it does seem like there's a problem. Yeah. Where do I start? Like there's just yeah, so there's many a lot things. There. There's a lot of there, but so here's the thing. I think, um, I think mentorship is a big thing. I think that we are, it's been popping up a lot, this notion of ageism and I'm not an, I, I'm not an ideology guy. Mm -hmm. I don't buy into a lot of the, the shit that's being flung around out there right now. Mm -hmm. But I do believe that, um, I do believe that we are missing an opportunity to groom and train and give people the tools that I was given. Right. You know, when I came into the business, I was mentored. Mm -hmm. I was taught right. like and hands on. And and that's just not happening anymore. And I don't know what it is. I don't know if it's because so much changes so quickly that there is no expert in, you know, television. Sure. You know, it's like, well, fuck, I'm an expert in YouTube, but that doesn't matter. That's not going to matter in two months mm -hmm. or maybe it will. But you know what I mean? It's it's. I don't know if that's what's, what it is or if it's, you know, if it is the downward pressure and I, I get the sense that might be it, you know, the big salaries get pushed out. And sure. We'll, we'll make this work. Yeah. Um, I think that's an issue. I think creatively, one of the things that we need to, I was just facing this the other day and it just, this, I'm just bringing this up because it drives me crazy, but the rules, like we like the rules that we apply now to like, well, what about the first three seconds of this thing? Because the person's going to, it's like, right. Right. Yeah. I don't know. Like, like. <laughs> I know that this thing's people are going to like it. Yeah. That's what I know. And so I think if we put too much in the way of, you know, well, we need to put a, a logo on the front of this. Right. In order for people to understand who it's coming from in case they skip it. I'm like, well, if they skip it, we've got a bigger fucking problem on our hands. <laughs> well, I think there's a lot of people out there, too, who look at data and um, want to leverage it because I think it's it's a lot easier to 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 believe in something that has some kind of data behind it. Right. But we also know it's like the data has to be assimilated into something. I, 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 and I don't know when this happened, but 
somebody did the exercise of taking, um, you know, verbatims from research on what people like, and they actually created an ad out of all the verbatims. And you can imagine what happened, sure. right? Like, yeah. it's a, you know, everybody likes this, the presence of water. So there was a stream. I think, I think they created a painting, actually. So it was like, you I know, think I saw this, right? Think, it's yeah, like everybody loves the presence of water. So there was a stream and people That's like right. animals. So yeah. there was a deer by the stream. And, and by the time it had ended, it was the worst, the worst thing, even though you could look back at it and kind of go, well, on paper, all of this data suggests that everyone's going to like it and it's hideous. Mm -hmm. So you're right in terms of like, you know, someone goes, well, what about the first three seconds? You got to, you know, you got to grab them and how are we going to do that? And then all of a sudden you're losing, you're losing the point of it. I mean, and I think we've all been in those meetings with, a, with, a, you know, with a client or, a, and, and they're not evil people by any stretch. They just, they just really want to make it work. Yeah. But it's, you know, you get to those, those meetings where it's like, well, what if I'm, you know, what if I don't see the whole thing? And it's like, well, God, like, what am I supposed to do with that? Yeah. I mean, we have a message. If, if I stopped, you know, if I stopped you one word, you know, one word into, I love you, well, we're not going to get to the good part. Um, you know, so, so yeah, I mean, data, data driven stuff. I think, I think the one key thing that everybody has to realize is that it's, it's kind of like research. Don't, you got to get beyond the verbatims yeah. and you got to assimilate it into something. Well, I agree. So I, you're a hundred percent right. When it comes to, I'm a, I, I believe in data, um, and I believe in using it, but the problem is, is nobody knows how to use it. Mm. And so we collect a shit ton of it and the client's like, well, we've got the data. Right. But we don't have anybody who can decipher the data. We don't have anybody who can break it down and peel out the important stuff, the stuff that actually is going to give you an insight into what your consumer's behavior is. Right. And there's some brilliant examples out there of creatives using data to transform and change their work mm. so that it not only continues the story and gives them an opportunity to let the creative live on further, but also to, to more meaningfully connect with their, with their customers. I think it was Wyden and Bud Light and the dilly dilly stuff. Do you remember that? I don't know. I don't. And I, I'm probably making myself look like a fool by no, not don't. knowing it. So but. it's, it was, it was a U.S. based campaign. So it wasn't, you know, it wasn't seen up here much, but the only, and the reason why I, I got to this backstory on it was I was able to see one of the creative directors from Wyden speak at a, at a conference in New York and, and they were telling the story about, um, how they had developed a campaign for Bud Light and there were four spots that they were developing, three or four. And one of the spots had uh, used this throwaway term in it, dilly dilly. And it was, the, I guess they were doing a Game of Thrones send off or something. But one of the characters at the end just goes dilly dilly, right? End of spot. I guarantee you the creative team thought it was hilarious, but never thought anything more of it. Right. Well, through data and data tracking, they started to realize that people thought that was fucking hilarious. And they were co-opting it online and they were using it and they were hashtagging it and they were sharing it. Dilly dilly. So once the data came back and they were able to sort of decipher what's going on and where it's coming from, they scrapped the other three spots and went back to the drawing board and started to write to dilly dilly. And what the brand was able to do is not only in real time grab hold of a swell mm. because they knew how to decipher the data, they knew how to pull things out, but do it in a way that was more meaningful because they understood the insight of what was driving it. They understood why consumers found it funny. It wasn't just a brand trying to co-op something. They actually, mm -hmm. they dug in and they had an understanding and it went bonkers to the point where, you know, in, the, in leading up to the Super Bowl, Philadelphia Eagles were playing and it became Philly Philly. Wow. And it just, it took off. And it, so that to me is a great example of, you know, creatives embracing data, not pushing back on it, not being like my gut. I know my gut. Like, right. We right. do have guts and we should respect our guts and our intuition is important. Creative people should respect it, but don't be afraid when someone comes into the room with some data and says, Hey, this is what we're hearing. Because I think there can be a real opportunity there if you know how to peel it out. Well, and you're talking about some of the hardest things to do. I mean, I know, uh, you know, I worked on the, um, the Special Olympics um, radio campaign with you and Gerald, I think. Schoenhoff, Schoen yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that was a fun spot. Um, and, um, and I remember being outside of the studio and talking to you about um, the strategy for it. And you, you said it so eloquently that I thought, this is probably the reason why Shane makes more money than I do. <laughs> right? Because... 
you'd really distilled it down. But I, the, the drum that I'm always beating when it comes to to young creatives is is that um, you do that's the part you should spend almost all of your time sweating. Yeah. And it is so hard to resist the urge to execute. It's so hard. Yeah. You know, it's like I don't know how you like to work, and I'm sure you've you've it's changed over the years. But but um, you know, I can remember there was this great hardcover book called um, Copywriting, and I should probably maybe in the YouTube section we'll we'll get the link to it because it's a really classic yeah. book on copywriters and writing. This one, one of the uh, one of the, the guys featured in there would talk about how he would have a pad and he'd be working out, um, you know, the strategic reasons why you're doing something. So, you know, we'll call it the left and right brain. And then um, on the other side, if he had a notion that it was like a lightning bolt or something that just entered his mind, he would scribble it down, but he wouldn't he wouldn't pursue it any further. Yeah, he wouldn't dig into it. Right. Because I think we all know that that, you know, by and large, the thing that's going to set you free is this 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 deep deep understanding of strategy correct and i so i subscribe to that i think that was abbott if i'm not mistaken yeah, yeah, yeah. so that's good that's very good memory so yeah. I'm, I'm gonna have to because it's, it's a great book i'm sure i have it in my house somewhere yeah. you know yeah uh i have a terrible memory that was yeah. the only time i've ever been able to do that <laughs> yeah you tell me you get a terrible memory I just, that was abbott yeah you know, I landed that one and i'm yeah. just you know i just ruined it yeah. but anyway um yeah no it's um creatively it's funny ken robinson and this is uh, Sherry Doug. She uses this quote a lot in her presentations, but he talks about creativity as being a process to arrive at original ideas. But the point about that is it's, it's a process. Mm -hmm. It's not random. Right. So the way that I certainly, the way that I ideate is very much than what you've just described in the sense that I start by just the stuff I write down at first is not creative at all. Mm -hmm. and there's nothing about it that's cute or clever or catchy. It's it's 100% just thoughts. And it's thoughts that are geared towards trying to, again, that search for how do I connect with people? How do I? So when I look at a problem and I look at a, a brand or I look at the, you know, and we've decided what that problem is. And if that problem really is a piece of advertising and, you know, the solution rather is a piece of advertising, then I sit down and I say, okay, what's the way that this is going to best connect with people. And I start to write those insights down and I start writing things like what's bothering people today? Mm -hmm. What's getting people angry? What are the things in this space that potentially, you know, get people talking or get people furious or get people cheering, whatever that is, what makes them feel around this? And I write all that stuff down and I come to a notion usually eventually where, and sometimes I don't, because mm. sometimes I suck. <laughs> but, the, you know, there's, I come to a notion where there's that truth and it, I feel it. And, I, you know, and this is where, you know, if I'm going to say to a creative, use your gut, use your intuition. If you feel it. If it seems like the truth. If it seems like the truth and you feel it deep down, it's probably going to resonate with other people mm -hmm. too, in all likelihood. Right. In, in one way or another, by the way, don't expect everybody to agree but it will make them feel. And that's what you're looking for. So once I find those things, and that's been articulated, again, it's rarely a creative articulation, mm -hmm. rarely, because I, I, I am a big believer in not going down a rabbit hole. Like, don't, don't chase it, just, it's there. Mm -hmm. But, you know, that piece is what you jump off from. Right. And I, you met earlier in the conversation, you mentioned this idea of out of home. And I'm such a fan of out of home. I've always been. I grew up in an out of home shop. My first job was at Holmes and Lee, and Peter Holmes was, in my opinion, one of the great masters of out of home. Mm -hmm. And the the note, the reason why I love it so much is it's such a pure test of an idea. That seven, six, seven words or less, if you can articulate everything that needs to be articulated in order for someone to grasp not just what you're saying, but feel it, right. then you're on to something. And so, and that comes with zero flash, zero decoration, zero fluff. And my, and my art directors go nuts too, because I don't believe in decorating advertising. Mm -hmm. I believe intent, that we need intent behind everything we do. Please don't decorate the billboard. Sure. And if the billboard can say what it can say with seven words and it doesn't need to, to be decorated, then let's just figure that out. Yeah, and I don't even know what to think about, um, about new media and and it, and it's like meteoric rise in terms of spends like i know you're you know you're looking at more and more investment it seems to be going that way less and less investment in traditional yeah um and yet 
uh, and I'm and I'm I'm really fascinated by it because uh, you know you got you have a format like the one that we're on right now where you know people are listening for over an hour to something right and and it goes against what you know everybody seems to think that you know that no one reads anymore or no one consumes stuff that's 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 longer format and um, and yet um, there was there was such a, a great test with outdoor because you did have to solve it in such a, sh a tiny little box. Yeah. And does that box, is that box going, if that box goes away, is it become even more difficult to be succinct? You know, like yeah, a I mean, lot of these mediums allow you to, to extend something beyond 30 seconds, yeah. beyond 60 seconds. Yeah. And those things that we thought were so confined. I mean, how many times did you sit there and go, you know, this is a great idea, but I think if I had 45 seconds, it would be, it would be amazing. 42. Right. Four, no, 42, 42 is the number. It's the perfect <laughs> length. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, it's true. But, uh, and now we seem to be living in, a, in an age where new media has become so expansive mm -hmm. and so not format. Um, it, you would think it would be freeing. And yet there's always that thing in the back of your head where it's like sometimes the being confined is the thing that actually presses you to to be succinct and be clear. Yeah, I mean, the distillation aspect of it is really important in what we do. And it basically comes down to the fact that people don't typically give a fuck about what we're talking about. Mm -hmm. So we have to make it interesting. And so it's interesting because, you know, this is a long format. People are not shy away from long formats. You know that. And, right. and people are diving in, but the content has to be there. Right. You have to be able to hold interest. You have to be invested enough in it to give that amount of time to it. And I just, I often find, and it's, this isn't a universal truth, so I'm not, but it's difficult to, to create that type of um, interest through the lens of a brand. Right. Now, there's opportunity to, to create interest outside of the brand, parallel to the brand, alongside of it, but not necessarily coming directly out of it. It's, it's real hard to put an hour's worth of content against Tide makes it whiter. Right. But, um, and so I think that there's value in it, but I think what, what truthfully, the distillation of a, of a big thought and making it really simple for people to digest is kind of what we're masters of, right? right. And, uh, and, and hitting people directly between the eyes with something that's gonna matter, make them feel and take away a message that matters to the brand is probably enough. Yeah, I mean, you've, you've brought up a really amazing point. I remember the first time somebody had explained to me the difference between high and low involvement categories. Right. And I thought, oh my gosh, I never even thought about it. And yet it, it's it's such a, it should be, it's, I guess it's not self-evident necessarily, but it's, it's, it was, it was through the exercise of writing a, a portfolio. And yep. it was like, do, make sure that you do a long copy ad so that people know that you, you know, a little bit you know about how to write. sentence structure yeah. and yeah. stuff like that. But for heaven's sakes, do it in a high involvement area because, you know, it's, you know, writing a long, although it might be cool to write an ad, you know, for a thumbtack that's, you know, paragraphs long. Yeah. It would stand to reason that if you had something as complicated as, say, life insurance, that's something that you're going to expand upon. Right. And there's lots of things to. Yeah. And you're right. I mean, you know, what what is what does a packaging company do about going? Well, we're really rabid about wanting to create content. Um, um, but like you have to find a reason we do for bubble wrap. To care. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like people have to you have to find yeah. a way in. It's why you're seeing this proliferation of purpose built advertising. Mm -hmm. People are trying to put meaning behind things like soap. Right. And the challenge becomes is when you borrow that interest, yeah, it comes off as disingenuous and you have you run the risk of of, of pushing people away because yeah. they just feel like now you're just trying to leverage something that they, they you think they matters to people. I think the brands that do it really well um, create interesting stuff, but I think you can create interest on almost anything. It just, it requires that level of work. You just have to really think about it and dig in and strategically understand why people might care. Yeah, it's interesting you bring that up. I mean, I, I, you know, I think anybody who works in the business or has worked in the business, of course, you're never gonna divorce yourself of, of your pedigree in that regard. And so you're always gonna make an assessment of work. Uh, in your living room or whatever, and you're going to say, oh, "I see that I'm a mile away," and you're, you know, you're, you know, you know, your dad sitting on the, co the sofa going, "Oh, what are you talking about?" Right. Um, but that one seems to be the most cringeworthy to me. Yeah. It's, um, it's, I don't know. It's like making, it's overemphasizing the importance of something that is part of our everyday lives and maybe peripherally involved in something that's bigger. Yeah. 
But when you just try to jam that in there, it's always a, it's always this like bad, like bad moment, you know. Yeah. And that's why I think a lot of advertising leans on comedy, you know, like it's hard to be dramatic. And and I think when it's done really well, we all just love it. Yeah. And, you know, if you take a more dramatic uh, approach, but comedy is going to save you in that way because, you know, you can make a you can make a joke about something and kind of get away with it. You know, I agree. Advertising is not funny anymore. Yeah, it's not. Well, you can't be. Well, I guess you can be, but yeah, it's dangerous. Now. It's a dangerous space. You have to be careful. You can't lean on the. The thing about comedy, right? It's the, the, the truth around comedy is it borrows, it, it, it relies on our common understandings, our common stereotypes, our common things that we all we share. Mm -hmm. And you know, comedians, you hear them up on stage, and they they con that's their go to. That's how they do it. That's how they connect. Right. That's how we all know we're on the same page. And unfortunately, a lot of that stuff is that's not supposed to be common knowledge anymore. It's not supposed to be stereotypically acceptable. So. Um, it makes it harder, but yeah. you know, I still think you can have, and I'm, I, we're at the garden actually thinking that way right now too, because I'm not naturally a comedy guy. Not my work. When you look at my work and my background, a, a comedy is not mm -hmm. my comfortable place. I've done some funny stuff over the years and I've certainly driven teams to, to deliver on that. And it's been good, mm -hmm. but it's not my comfort zone. Right. Um, Angus and Steven. That's their comfort zone. Right. You know, Peter and Carlos, that's their comfort zone. Sure. And, um, you know, Angus actually said to me recently, we were, it was, we were chatting and he was giving me some advice and he's like, you know, we got to stop fucking taking this all so seriously. Like yeah. everybody's just taking everything so seriously. And this is a fun business. Yeah. And consumers are willing to have fun with us. And we, they're, if you can make them laugh and make them feel something good about it, that's all you have to do. You don't have to go much deeper than that. Right. And I agree. I, and I feel like the pendulum has swung so far into the woke culture of understanding sure. and we're sensitive and we're purpose built and we're all these things. And it's like, hey, maybe we're just fun. Well, you brought up Gillette and we all saw, mm -hmm. saw kind of like that whole kind of like speed wobble and yeah. what happened around that. And it's, you know, it is, yeah, again, to bring up that, you know, double edged sword is like go go down those alleyways at your own peril yeah because we do live in a world where it's like you know there's a lot of cops out there mm -hmm. and if they feel if they sniff around and see that you're you know someone is somehow going to be offended yeah i mean i always think about at the advertising industry as one of those industries where you know uh loved or hated but never ignored and to do that you're going to have to have an opinion and yeah. guess what if you have an opinion you might have, you that, might upset somebody. That's right. No, for right. sure. Well, we had an interesting thing happen a couple of years ago, and it just goes to show, even regardless of the intent or the intention and what you want to genuinely achieve, and it was, it was, it was coming from a good place. Mm -hmm. You can still fucking step in it, right? right. So we did um, a, a video for Canada 150 for Roots. And one of the things that, and in hindsight, I wonder, you know, I still believe in what we did. I actually, I stand behind it. And mm -hmm. in the end, it was good. It, it worked out well for the client, but um, it, it just came out of left field. We, we did this piece where everybody in the country was avoiding the conversation around the fact that not all of our citizens believed that this was the 150th birthday of their country. Right. It was, and it was pretty glaring. Like it wasn't literally didn't believe it. Well, no, because we our indigenous communities feel like they've been around a little longer. Okay. Right. And so it wasn't all that inclusive mm. in the sense of, yeah, we're all just celebrating Canada as 150 years. And there's a lot of people going, well, I don't know. Right. Okay. And so hmm. what we did with, with, with roots and what, what we wanted to do with their, with their videos, it was actually a really good time for us to be talking about Canada in a meaningful way because Trump had just been elected. Mm -hmm. He was at that moment, like closing down borders, turning people away. And there was this idea around sort of Canadians and it was always that sort of backhanded compliment about us being nice. Right. They're so nice. They almost right. say it to you with like a pat on the head. Mm -hmm. So we thought about a little bit, like, what does it mean to be nice? You know, what does it really mean to be nice? Like, what is nice when in, the, in terms of being a country? Sure. And what that started to reflect back to us was that there's it's like being nice means taking some, some stances sometimes. It means being difficult. It means challenging. It mm -hmm. means the unpopular decision sometimes. Right and being brave. And so we started going down that path with the campaign and this notion of being nice. And we said, well, you know what, if we're gonna talk this way, we can't ignore the fact that there's a whole segment of our population that's being ignored right now mm -hmm. around this idea 
of Canada 150, and then more so, there's bigger challenges against that community currently. And, and you know, if we're actually going to call ourselves nice as a nation, we should probably point to some of the things that we need to work on. Mm. And so we brought that into the commercial, and um, it was a brave move for the client. It, it was a big move for the client, and part of it was not just acknowledging it, but we wanted to make sure that there was something being done to help it. So we we did a whole charitable piece where proceeds of sales would go towards me to wees indigenous youth programs. And it was, it was really well intentioned. And there was, a, so how it came about, there was a footage in the, in the thing. So what we did to leverage in the commercial was we used CBC footage of all these Canadian moments. And there was footage at the end of a native protest and a drumming circle. Mm -hmm. And we called that out as a moment where you know, I think the line against it was, and sometimes nice means knowing when sorry isn't enough. Okay. Pretty profound thing. Yeah, yeah, I know. I mean, just thinking about it right now is making me nervous. Right. So we put that out into the world. And this was, you know, this is, again, just a moment of, like, in the midst of purpose-based advertising and how do we want to make sure that brands are doing the right thing. So that goes out, and it's being applauded. People are loving it. And they're thinking this is really wonderful. Until one of the guys in the protest shot from the CBC who stands against 150 goes to Twitter and says, how fucking dare you use me in a commercial to sell Canada 150. Right. You're doing the very thing you've done. Yes. This for Boom. The whole thing explodes. Wow. Like we're just like, holy shit. And he's out there on Twitter calling us out mm -hmm. and um, calling the brand out and demanding that the commercial be taken down. And so it was a really interesting moment for me, certainly, because it really, I realized for real how really real mm -hmm. that shit can be yeah. and how this isn't delicate. Like this, you know, there's no, sometimes there's no room for that in what we do. And so it was, it was good because what we were able to do and the client was great and he ended up being wonderful. So he became ultimately an ambassador for us. He, we, we got him on the, a phone call and we chatted with him and we had a great conversation. Yeah. And, we helped him understand our intention and he was open-minded and thoughtful and, and he got on board and actually took on a, a bit of a role in helping us um, get the word out in a really positive way. And, and so that ended up smoothing out okay. Wow. But it was like, holy shit, right? Should we really be doing this? Yeah, you're looking at a potentially a flashpoint. In, yeah, in a but I, mean, I think the good news, and then going back to my point earlier, and this is what clients have to be ready to, to embrace or not embrace in our world today, which is, I mean, they have to be willing to embrace it. And if they aren't, then they just have to be ready to be wallpaper. But, you know, the likability scores on that spot online were off the chart. Mm. And the bulk of people who saw it, including indigenous people, loved it and appreciated it. But the cost of that was all of the, the, the repulsion and the hatred and the pushback. So was it, you know, you know, a slightly different skew from the purpose-based aspect of it, but it, it really does kind of fundamentally show that today, if you want to make an impact, you have to be ready to offend. Well, that's a, I think that's probably a good place to, uh, probably to wrap things up. I know we started this thing by just like, you know, we started chatting and then we just started recording and it didn't have a, a natural flow, but it's been amazing sitting here talking to you and, and, you know, there's probably six different things that happened in this, uh, in this interview that we could probably expand on more. So we're going to have to have you back. I would love that. But um, I want to thank you so much for Shane for being on the on the show. And and um, it's been great talking to you. Thanks for having me, man. It's been a pleasure. Thanks. This episode has been brought to you by the National Advertising Challenge, North America's only brief based challenge that sends winners to Cannes, France. Thank <laughs> you.